So I want to invite you all, since we're a Bible-believing church, to grab a copy of the Bible and put it in your hand. And if you have a fancy device, as some of us do, please uh, open up your Bible on your phone, on your tablet, on your whatever. I don't know. Maybe you got a PC, a laptop, a laptop or a desktop. You just lug it in here. I don't know what you got, but uh, open it up and put your eyes on God's Word. Um, I'll do my best. But at the end of the day, there's only, one, uh, there's only one way to know what the real truth is. And, and God wrote a book, amen, and it's in there. So, so I want to I just do this. Um, for those of you that have not been here the last couple of weeks or the last month or so, we've been, uh, we've been just going through the book of Ephesians. That's just what God laid on my heart for this church. And, and so I've been trying to be faithful in that and just going through the text uh, section by section, this is what it says, this is what it means, this is how we can apply it to our life. That's what we've been doing. And I don't want to veer from that. Um, however, um, I'm just going to take a, I'm not going to take a sharp turn at all. I'm going to take a slight turn. And, and uh, the reason being is, um, over the last couple of weeks, as I've been reading through Ephesians to prepare, uh, I've had this question pop into my mind often, and, and I've been kind of suppressing it a little bit, but as I was reading this week in another portion of Scripture, that question just jumping off the page like, listen, you stubborn Hebrew, ask the question. And so I got to ask the question. And that question came to the surface aggressively as I was reading through the book of Acts. I was in Acts chapter 20, and I'd like to invite you to go there with me because that's where we'll be kind of camped out here for mo much of the night. And when I say that it's not a, a, a sharp turn, I say this. It's not the study of the book of, of Ephesians. However, it is Paul, after planting the church, he calls for the leaders of the Ephesian church. He calls them together, and he starts to talk to them about the church at Ephesus. And so... This section just brought that question that I had up big time. And I can't dodge it anymore. And the question that I had was, is this church right here, Revolution Church? I can't speak for anybody else's church. But, but this is the church that God placed me in. And this is the church that he asked me to pastor. And so it is my responsibility to ask this question. Is this church legit? Now, the question that kept coming up over the last few weeks was, are you a Great Commission church? But it's more than just the Great Commission. Are you a legit church is the real question. And, 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 and the question is this, are you a church? Or are you a Matthew 16, 18 church where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? See, that's the question. Because a church is just this. In, in a country like this, the church is assumed to be a group of Christians that get together. Sometimes they're Baptists and sometimes they're Methodists and sometimes they're Pentecostal and so, and so forth. But the, the assumption is when you use the word church, there's a bunch of Christians getting together. But that's not always the case. The, the church, it could be any group of people that come together around some belief system. And they meet in a place and they conduct any sort of religious activities. It doesn't have to be Christian stuff. You can, you can have all kinds of different churches, so I did a little research. And I found a couple of wacky churches. There's a couple of wacky churches out there, yo. Did you ever hear of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster? No, I'm not kidding. Has anyone ever heard of it? It's for real, dudes. It's for real. It was founded in 2005. And listen, it's a legally recognized religion in Poland, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. You can actually get married by a, a, an ordained minister of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, and that marriage sticks legally. It's real. And there's lots of people in it. Did you ever hear of the Church of Satan? There is one. The real deal. I looked it up. It's a real church. It was founded by a guy named Anton LaVey. 
years ago, and it just promotes free carnality. It's, it's really atheism with a, with a label. It's, it's, you can believe in whatever you want. You can do whatever the flesh leads you to do. If it feels good, do it. Because there's no rules, right? So atheists believe that. But, 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 but this gives the, 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 the authority there to Satan himself. It promotes everything that we don't believe. When, when the Bible talks about our faith, it's kill the flesh, kill the flesh. Don't do what you feel like doing because it's wrong. Let the Lord lead. The, the, the church of Satan saying, no, 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 the flesh rules, do it. It feels good. Have fun and enjoy it. Everything goes, no rules. It's the church of Satan. And so the question beckons, is Revolution Church Jesus Christ's church? And, and, and the reason i got to ask this is, like, I don't, I don't know, like, everything you do day to day constantly, right? But this is what I do day to day constantly. This is my life. And a lot of you are in that boat with me. There's a lot of you in this church that spend a lot of time and thought and prayer and work to, 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 to make this church good, to work this thing. And, and so we have, to under, we have to decide, is this just a, a church? Or, or, or this, if we're going to spend our resources, not just money, but our everything into this thing, is it Jesus Christ's church? And we have to often ask ourselves this question. Are we, as Paul said to the Ephesians, are we a house built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Christ Jesus as our cornerstone? See, that's what he said to the church in Ephesus. And these people he labeled at his greeting in the book of Ephesians as God's holy people, faithful followers of Christ. And, and, and the people that are faithful followers of Christ, they're a church that is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus carries all the weight of that. He's everything to the church. And we can't simply assume that we're a Christian church because we have a cross. When you guys came in, you saw there's a, a pretty cross on the wall, right? That doesn't make it a Christian church. And we can't assume that we're a Christian church just because we say that we are. I would venture to say that there are many in the church, in America at least, that, that come to church every single week and they fill the seats up and they come all the time and they say that they're Christians, but a simple glance at the fruit of their life and you say, well, what they say in this book and the way they live are way different. And we would wonder if they are. So... We go back in history a little bit and we see that Paul, he, he goes to Ephesus uh, by the leading of God's Holy Spirit. He goes to Ephesus, which is in a modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, and he begins to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to the people and, and they begin to accept it and they hear the good news and they repent of their sin and they turn to God and they're getting baptized and he appoints elders and the church plant begins. Awesome new church. And then he leaves town. He's going to go do it again in another city. Wherever the Spirit leads him to go, he goes to do it. But later on, he calls him back to talk to him. But sometime after he starts this church and it starts to get some traction, and it's growing and it's healthy and it's full of love, he, he writes a, a letter to them called Ephesians and in it, like I said, it, he calls them faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now you've got to understand that this book of Ephesians was written after this text that we're going to read in Acts 20. The, 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 uh, the events of Acts 20 happened before the book of Ephesians was written. Do you see? And so he calls these leaders back to him and he, he's talking to the leaders in Ephesus on how to be a church that is, a faith, that is faithful in following Christ. And that's why when he writes the letter to the Ephesians, he can, call, he can put that stamp on them and say, you've been faithful followers of Christ. Remember, the book of Ephesians is not a harsh rebuke, like you're doing it wrong, you've got to get right. It's not like that. It's you're doing it really right, but I know you can do better. I want to encourage you to be better to be more Christ-like, to be more effective. And so the question here is, what does it look like 
to get that type of seal of approval on your church where Jesus could say of your church, you are, you are my faithful followers. And that's what Paul tries to do in this section of Scripture. Paul is the guy who said, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay? So when Paul writes something in the Bible, he's not, say, he's not writing it so you can say how wonderful he is. He's writing it because, again, he's the follow me as I follow Christ guy. So when Paul does something, you're supposed to do something. What Paul does, you do. He's not super Christian. He's just like you and me. You're to do just like he does. You're not to praise him. You're not to be in awe of him. You're not to say, I can't do that. No, Paul's putting in there as a, dis as a prescriptive text to you because he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so he outlines here what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ. And so I just kind of jotted down uh, three things and I'm going to, to read this with you real quick and then we'll kind of go through it, okay? So Acts chapter 20, there's your foundation. You ready? Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 18. You good? You there? Everyone's got it? All right, got it. Paul has traveled to a town I can't pronounce, I can guess. Anyone want to guess that one? Miletus? Mel I'll, I'll just, let's do it like, let's do it tough. Melitos. Because I want to be like a gladiator. He's gone to Melitos. He sent a message to the elders. He says, come hang out with me. So when they arrived, when the elders, the leaders of the church, of this group of people that are faithful followers, he's going to outline exactly what it means to do that. Do as I do, right? When they arrived, and de he declared... You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I've done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the pl plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling, them, telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God, and of having faith in our Lord Jesus." And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now that, I'm sorry, and now... I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it is not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, His church, purchased with His own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you elders. Amen. Amen. Okay. So that's God's words preached to you, and I'm going to try my best as a uh, limited man to help you with that, because I want our church to be a, a faithful church. I want to be a faithful church. Are you with me? Okay, so here's what a faithful church is. A f here's the first thing. A faithful church finishes the job. It finishes the job. Look back, and, and I'm not making any of this stuff up. That's why I asked you to look in God's word. Uh, look at verse 18 and 19. Uh, faithful church finishes the job. Look what Paul says. He says, uh, you know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work. Now, it goes on, and we don't have to dismiss any of the, the stuff that's after that, but let's just stop right there for a second. We, we, from the day he arrived till right now, he said, I have, I have done the Lord's work. I, I have not taken time off. I have not slacked. I have not, I have not just, listen, I have not just served for a season, because you get that a lot. I, I, I'm not dwelling on the glory of, of, of ministry past where it used to be awesome and we used to do this, but now I'm kind of taking it easy. Uh, he didn't set conditions on his service. Like, I'm only going to serve if they uh, appreciate me and I'm only going to serve if they pay me and I'm only going to serve if it's convenient for 
for me if I have a little extra time for you. No, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And from the day I got to Ephesus till right now, I have done the Lord's work without stop. I knew that wouldn't get a huge applause because it's not popular, but that's what it says, amen? That's what it says. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this in John 17, 4. He says, I brought glory to you, Father, here on earth by completing, not just by doing, by completing the work that you gave to me. See, he bring, he does, you don't bring glory to God as much by just doing the work. You, do, you bring the ultimate glory to the Father by completing the job that he has given you. And Paul himself states in 2 Timothy 4, 5, I love this, you should jot this down, it should be underlined, highlighted, circled, squared, everything. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 5, he says, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Uh, I, the two words that I have circled, I have all highlighted, the, the two that I have a, a square around is, is work. Work. The work of the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, the, 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 the task is daunting, but it's, it's a worldwide task, right? It's going to take some work to get this thing done. To reach the ends of the earth with the good news of the gospel is going to take work. You're going to have to really work at this. How many people would love it if we could just go to work every day and just chill and get paid? Come on. The rest of you are stinking liars. Because you know that's true. I would, I've, I've told my wife I could stay home and just love on you all day and play with the kids and get paid. I am so in. I'm so in. I can't find that job. And I'm telling you right now, some people treat the ministry of the gospel like that. The Bible says that we're to work at this thing. It should take major effort on your behalf. And not just to kind of do it sort of. He says to fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. So, so in our text right here, in Acts chapter 20, we see that Paul is sharing with them that a legit church of Jesus Christ is a group of people that finishes the job. They finish the job. Uh, we'll go on in the verse. He says, I've done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. So he, he's like, um, how, many people are, uh, how many people are crying with tears of joy as they work? How many? No one, right? I love being a janitor. I love it when it's 180 degrees outside and I'm cutting grass all day. And you just weep with joy. Yes, Lord Jesus. Woo! And you just cry, right? So is it kind of safe to assume that when he says that, his, that he worked humbly, constantly, and, and people were trying to kill him and trying to put him in prison and trying to whip him and beat him, that maybe the tears weren't tears of joy? So was it always great, but... He says, I'm going to finish this job. And he goes on, he says, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. And so we need to continue to do this thing. And one of the ways we do this, Revolution, is we do this. We get together. And it's not just that I would encourage you, but the Scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 10 that we get together and we encourage one another, right? We encourage one another. So I want to encourage you right now that when you get done hearing me yell at you, that you don't just split for the door as soon as the song says, okay, good night. You're here, and we can't do this alone. I need you to encourage me. Because when I get done, I'm going to tell you something. When I get done here, I'm going to be physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually drained. I'm leaving it all on the court, right? And so I need you to encourage me. I don't want to do all the encouraging. I want you to encourage me, and I want you to encourage each other, because life is tough, and we need each other, and we need to do, we need to work at that. It's not all easy to go up to people. Who's, who, who just loves a perfect stranger just goes up to him? Who's the bold person in the group that loves to go up to the perfect stranger and say, I love you, man? 
How many people, yeah, I don't want to pick on you, Candy. <laughs> it's not easy, though, is it, right? It's not easy. She's getting good at it, though. God, God, is, God, is, God is at work, right? But, but it's not easy, but we need to encourage one another. That's why you're here. You didn't come here to get your belly filled. You came here to get it filled and then, then puke it on someone. That's what you do. Okay, amen. All right, so here, the first thing is a, a faithful church finishes the job. Amen? amen. Okay. I want to hear a better amen than that. Uh, a faithful church finishes the job. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Here's the second thing. Uh, a faithful church, I love this. A faithful church preaches the gospel. A faithful church preaches the gospel. Look, let's go back again. I'm not making any of this up. This is just all right here. It's all we're doing, just going through the Bible, going through the Bible. Verse 20, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear. What you need to hear. See, there's a lot of things. This is a big book, isn't it? Some of you have like one of them big old King James that's about the size of that speaker, right? It's a big book. And there's lots of topics in it. There's lots of things we can talk about. And, and, I, and, and I do. I, I, I try to do that. I try to be faithful to the text. You know, whatever's there, you know, don't dodge it. Just talk about it. Present the full counsel of God, cover to cover to the people, and let the Holy Spirit do what he does with those words. Yeah. Right? That's what I do. But, but, but Paul says here, there's certain things that we need to hear. See, some people want to hear uh, that, that they want to come to church and, and feel better about themselves. I'm kind of having a bad day, and I need to be, I need, I need you to tell me, tell me how great I am. That's what I need you to tell me. To do. I need you to tell me how great I am. Can somebody tell me how great I am, right? That's what I want to hear. I want you to tell me that, that I dress nice, and I want you to tell me that I'm valuable, and I want you to tell me that I'm good, and that I'm doing a good job, and I want, and I want, and I want, and I want. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with that. We should compliment each other if it's honest. And we should encourage one another. We talked about that a minute ago, right? But there's certain things that God's Word says we need to hear. We need to hear the Gospel. 2 Timothy 4.3 says the polar opposite is going to take place. And it's so true. That people look for teachers to tell them what they want to hear. The Bible calls that itching ears. I got an itchy ear, man. I just, I, I got something I need. I, there's something up here that I need to hear. I want to hear this. You should do this. You should preach this. You should make me feel better. This is what I need to hear. Make me feel better about myself, right? But I can tell you something. I'm going to stand before you now and tell you that me, Moses Robbins, the pastor of Revolution Church, I will never, ever cave to that. Do you understand? That as long as I breathe and I am allowed the privilege of pastoring this church, I will never tell you what you want to hear. I will always tell you what you need to hear according to God's word. That's what I'm going to do. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to, to share the gospel with you. And listen, this should never get boring. This is the, listen, it's the greatest story ever. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. And, and to get tired of that, is crazy. This should excite you. This, this is unbelievable what has happened. Do you understand that, that every single person born on this earth is born with original sin directly from Adam and Eve? It's burned into our DNA. And also burned into our DNA is this, this nasty, ugly angst to, to, to purposely and willfully rebel against a perfect, perfect God. And, and listen, you, you cannot get right on your... You, there's no way to get right. There's no way that you can earn right. There's no way to des, that you deserve right. You certainly, I don't care how much money you have, you can't buy right. And, and let me be clear that your active, willful rebellion is, and mine is called sin. And the payment for this sin is eternal death. But Romans 6.23 says that the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Right? That's good news. That's really good news. And, and Jesus, he clarifies in John 14, 6, he says that this free gift is awesome, but, but, but that I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one else, no one can get to the Father except through me. 
that no one else, you will never see a, a Buddhist in, 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 in heaven. You will never see a Jew in heaven. You will never see a, a Muslim in heaven. That there's only one way to glory, and it's through Jesus Christ the Lord. And we should be praising him that he made a way where there's no way. That's amazing news. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. And listen, in the hustle bustle of this crazy, frantic world where every single thing is competing for your attention every second, do this, don't do that, wear this, wear that, go here, go there, buy this, own this, this is what your identity is, this is who you are, do this and be better. In all that crap that we're immersed in every single day of our life, we need to hear that often. You need to hear the gospel. You need to hear the gospel. The, the church, the, a faithful church, must proclaim the good news to the people. That we need to repent of sin. We need to turn back to God. And it's through faith in Christ Jesus alone. And this message is not just for the world because they need hope and they need a Savior. But it's for the Christian too. Because it doesn't make any difference who you are. You can be serving the Lord for, for 75 years. But the Bible says that all of us fail in many ways. And that includes the Christian. And if you're an awesome Christian, and a lot of you are, I know you, you're incredible people, but even you, you get sideways just a little bit. And so we need to be, we don't need to be preaching at everyone who's lost. You need to repent of sin. Yeah, that's true. But we need to be telling the Christians also that repentance is available to you. And you just need to, listen, you, you stumbled a little bit. But, but you can repent. You can, you can get back on track. You, you can turn back to God and just come to Jesus. And the Bible says that by no means will Christ Jesus turn away anyone who comes to him. It doesn't make any difference what you've done or how far you've gone or how long it's been since you prayed or how long it's been since you went to church or how long it was since you read your Bible. By no means will he say no to anyone who comes to him. That message needs to be preached all the time. A faithful church preaches the gospel, and I promise you I'm going to keep doing it. And listen, you just heard the good news, and I don't know everybody in this room right now. I don't. There's some visitors here. And I'm not calling you up, but I'm telling you right now that you have an opportunity right this second, because tomorrow's not promised, and you can repent of your sin, and you can turn to God through Christ Jesus right now and, and receive forgiveness and assure your position in heaven right this second. And I don't know what anyone ever told you in a church growing up. I don't know what your mama or your daddy or your grandma told you, but I can tell you it's as easy as what God's Word says, that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that, that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. That's it. You just got to pray. You just got to tell Him. I don't know how you're going to tell Him. You can use sign language. You can draw it on a piece of paper. You can yell it out to the rooftops, or you can do it quietly right now, or you can get with me afterwards. We can pray together if you don't know how to pray because you're thinking, that's crazy. I'll be crazy with you. I'll be crazy with you, and I'll pray with you. And somehow, some way, I don't even understand it all, but somehow, some way, God, the creator of heaven and earth, who spoke and the plants came out of his mouth, he will hear your prayer. He will hear your cry, and he'll run to you and save you. And we can do that right now. We can do it right now. <clears throat> so, the first two things are that a faithful church finishes the job, and I could say that the second thing is to melt it all down. I'd say it's, it's, it's to be faithful is to, is, to be, is to finish, and then also to focus. You know what I mean? Like focus, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. That's what everyone needs to hear, right? The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And so the third thing is kind of is weird because it, it's three things that, that take place or that are in order to do the first two. But it's right here in the text. To finish and to focus, to, to finish well, to fully complete the ministry that God has called you to, and to stay faithful to the gospel, the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus, is three things. One, it's mandatory. Two, it's mysterious. And three, oftentimes it's merciless. I'm just kind of trying to, to, to break down the, 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 the speculation and, and the I'm not sure what this Christianity is going to look like. I don't want to, I want to dispel the, the fibs and the lies and, the, and, and, and the, the, the bad pictures of what Christianity really is. Because it's not all smiley and perfect and, and rainbows and unicorns and bunny rabbits all the time. Amen? It's not. It's not. Listen, the greatest, the, if you want to call them the greatest Christians ever, they all got killed for believing it. 
our Savior Himself, who we bow before, the Creator of heaven and earth, was, was put up on a cross and He was ripped apart and spit on and stripped and killed. So who are we to think that life as a Christian is going to be a bed of roses, right? Anyone living in that place? Doesn't exist. Well, it does. It's not of this world. We'll get there someday, amen? amen? I hope to see you all there. I pray I do. Make it happen right here, okay? Come on now. Don't waste. Don't wait. Don't disappoint me. Help the preacher, please. Okay, so they're mandatory. It's mandatory, it's mysterious, and it's merciless. Let's look and see if I'm telling the truth. Look at verse 22. Necessity of preaching the gospel. He says, And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He knew that that's where he needed to go to, to complete the work that God had given him. And he says, I'm bound by the Spirit. Some translations would say, I am bound by an inner compulsion, like this thing. You ever have the thing? So one translation says, I am, I am shackled by the Spirit. Like, I, I have no choice. I, I, there, 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 there's, there, he has invaded my life. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.13 that when you bowed your knee to Jesus... When you said yes to the Lordship of Christ, that, the, that His Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, now lives inside of you. That, that's a reality. You've got to understand, like, that's incredible. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, yeah. right? And so Paul's saying, I am, I am bound by this Spirit. I, I have to go do this. It's mandatory that I go and finish this work. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt that without that thing? And it's, it, you know, everybody's different, but everything and everybody around you is screaming, No, don't do that! But there's this thing inside of you that's not yelling, it's whispering. Do it. Do this. I mean, I've had times where my bank account was screaming, No! But there was a whisper inside of me that said, Give. And it makes no sense. It makes no sense, right? How in the world do you expect me to give? I'm broke. Do you trust me? I spoke the worlds into creation. You won't give me 50 bucks. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> do you ever have that? Do you ever have that, that thing, and that angst inside of you that just says, I don't even get this thing, but I have to do this thing. Let, let, let me explain to you what's happening in these moments that we've all... Have you ever had... Raise your hand if you've had that moment when everything's saying don't, but you've got something inside you that's saying, i got to do this. You've all had it? It's about 75% or so of the room. I'd venture to say that it's 100% if you're a believer, but you are shy. But he can give you a different spirit if you ask him <laughs> to be bold. Let me tell you what's happening. Can you drop the bass out of my channel completely, please? So I don't go, bang, bang. I can beatbox right here. Boom, boom, boom. It's a work in progress. We're just getting going here. Let me tell you what's happening in these moments when the world and everything around you is screaming, don't do this, and something inside of you is saying, do it. Jesus said in John 7, 38, he says this, Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Or some translations will say rivers of living water will flow from their belly. What is this rivers of living water? Well, the next verse clarifies what it is. It's the Holy Spirit that you got when you said yes to Jesus. And there, he'll, he will not come out of here. He will come out of here. And so when everything is screaming and your mind is screaming and your bank account is screaming and your friends are screaming and your family is screaming, don't do this. That's madness. There's something inside of you that says, but I, your guts, right? It's the Holy Spirit of God desperately trying to lead you to green pastures. And the world will say no. And God says, 
Yes. That deep down in the guts angst to do something that makes no sense is the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what Paul was feeling right here. When he said, I am bound by the Spirit, he's saying, I, I don't even understand why I would do it. It makes no sense. When you read on what the, this same Holy Spirit was telling him, what was going to happen, you're going to go to jail, you're going to get beaten and whipped, it's going to suck big time. But go. Man. He was shackled, imprisoned by the Holy Spirit. I have to do what he says to do. Being faithful means that it's mandatory. I have to do this. I must carry out the work that God has called me to. It's not reserved for the spiritually elite. It's for all of us. Here's the second thing. To be faithful uh, in, in, in uh, following Christ means it's mysterious. Look back at the text. And now I am bound, same verse, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Look at this. I don't know what awaits me. I don't know what awaits me. I, re, let me tell you something, in case you didn't know, like results are not guaranteed in anything. Nothing in life. Will it work? I don't know. Uh, will, 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 will he or she accept uh, this, this proposal of marriage? Will, will he or she accept this proposal of Jesus? I don't know. Will this thing that I start for the Lord, will it grow? Will, it, will, it, will I succeed in what I'm doing for the Lord? He's called me to do this. Will it seem as though I'm successful? If he said, go tell Cheryl about me, am I guaranteed that she's going to bow her knee to Jesus right then and there? No. What is this elusive Holy Spirit going to ask me to do next? I have no idea. Listen, I love every one of you, and I can tell you that I've studied this book for years, and my answer is, I have no idea. I have no idea what he's going to ask you to do. But I can tell you this, that Abraham had no idea where God wanted him to go, but God said go. And Moses had no idea what to say, but God said go. And, and Ananias, the guy, when, when Paul got saved, when he was Saul, the Christian killer, and he got converted to Paul, and, and God said to Ananias, go to this guy, Saul, who's now Paul, and lay hands to him because he's blind. And I want you to put your hands to him and pray for him and release him of the blindness and, and commission him to go. And he's like, Why? he's a killer. Are you kidding me? You, you're going to ask me to go? And so listen, Abraham didn't know where to go. God said go. Moses didn't know what to say. God said go. And Ananias had no idea what to expect. And God said go. Trust me. That's what we need to do. Everyone must go. Ananias, you've got to imagine for a moment. Put yourself in the story. Was he scared? Got to be. Paul was a killer. He was a, he was a persecutor of, of these Christians. And he would drag them off into jail. And he would have them killed. He's a murderer. And God said, Ananias, I want you to go hang out with him. Are you kidding me? He's going to kill me. He was scared, wasn't he? He didn't know what to expect, but God said, no. You have to go anyways. It doesn't make any difference what you think or how it feels. Just go. I would tell you that, that going under the compulsion of the Holy Spirit, that you should proceed under a yellow light, be cautious, be aware of what's going on around you. But by no means does mystery mean a red light. Don't let the fear of the unknown scare you into not doing what God's telling you to do. Obey. If you want the bless, listen, the greatest funnel that God will bless people with is a funnel called obedience. And if you want his blessing, you've got to be obedient to what he says to do. Do not quench or stifle the Holy Spirit of God. 
Do as he says. Do as he says. <clears throat> being faithful is mandatory. Being faithful is mysterious. Here's the last thing. Being faithful is, mer- sometimes it's merciless. It's merciless. It'll, it will often include uh, suffering. Of course, let's look back to the text, see if this claim is correct. It says, I'm bound by the Spirit, bound by inner compulsion, shackled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I, I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit that's telling him to go <laughs> tells me in city after city. So it wasn't just once. It's constant. It's not going to be good for you. In city to city, that jail and suffering lie ahead. It's not always peaches and cream following the mandate that God has on your life. So I don't know if you chose this church to be encouraged, but that's the best way that I can encourage you, which is telling you the truth. That it's not always easy. And we see Paul illustrates this here in this text, that going means jail and suffering that lie ahead. You know, the the book of Hebrews... Chapter 11 is known as the uh, Faith Hall of Fame. And in it, the author of Hebrews, some think it's Paul, I don't really know. Um, But the author, he outlines to us all these amazing Bible figures, and you've probably heard of all of them, these incredible stories of great things that these people did with God and for God. And we read that, right? But being faithful doesn't always mean you make it to that list. Because it also says in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 35, it says others, after he mentions all the ones that did great things, he says, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Other translations say impaled. Do you know what that means? Sit on a pole. That means you got impaled. Do you ever see uh, Frozen? Who's seen Frozen? Yeah. The, the snowman. What's his name? Olaf. The, 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 the ice thing. It, what it, the icicle goes through him. He goes, <laughs> I've been impaled. <laughs> Yeah, if you did that, you wouldn't be laughing. Okay? Some got impaled, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. So they earned a good reputation, but their life wasn't easy, was it? It was merciless. Sometimes it's brutal. And being faithful, sometimes that happens. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 17, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must, say must. Is there wiggle room in that? Show me how much wiggle room is in the word must. Zero. If you are to share in the glory of God, you must share in his suffering. There's no way to circumvent that system as a believer. It's part of the deal. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul takes a more aggressive position even than that in Philippians 3.10 when he says, it's not just that you must suffer. He says, I want to suffer with Christ, sharing in his death so I will experience the resurrection. So he goes beyond the I have to to I want to. I want to. Can you imagine that? Who in their right mind would say that? I want to suffer with Christ. I want to go through the hell that he went through in this earth. I want to do that so somehow, some way, I can experience the victory that comes in being part of the body of Christ. And so we have an expression around here that I've been saying for years now, and if you don't know it, here it is. It's open it, read it, and do it. And those are nice words, right? They sound good. We can make a sticker like that. Revolution Church. Open it, read it, do it. That's catchy, right? Yeah, yeah but it's not very easy. 
Like I could get up here and I could tell you, open it, read it, do it. Open it, read it, do it. And you could tell me to shut up because it's not easy to do. It's not easy to give your last. It's not easy to wait on someone. It's not easy to forgive someone who punched you in the face. It's not easy to, to forgive someone who robbed or stole or cheated on you. It's not easy to do those types of things. It's not easy to wait on some homeless guy who stinks. It's not easy to do those things, right? It's not easy to have compassion on people that are different than you. It's not easy. It's not easy to be relentless in your pursuit of souls for the king. It's not easy to give of your every resource towards the kingdom of God advancing. It's not easy. And sometimes it's merciless. Sometimes opening it, reading it, and doing it means that I read the Bible and in it it's constantly give my stuff away. Give my stuff away. I thought you were trying to help me, God. Why do you keep telling me that it's much better to give than to receive? I need something here. Uh, well, why are you telling me to, 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 to sell my stuff and bring it to the apostles so that nobody would lack? Why are you telling me that? I'm the one who needs something here, Lord. Help me. Throw me a bone. Why? Why? Well, I'll tell you, it's not easy. Because sometimes when you really, really want to be faithful followers of Christ, that means you're going to have to go without some stuff. That means some of the luxuries that the normal Americans are, are, are encouraged to, to, to cover themselves with all the time and the nicest stuff and, and work all day for me so I can gather my things and all me and make my nice house and put a big fence around it and stay off my grass for all show too. Sometimes you have to give up some of that stuff. And in the world that is, that is just crushing us all the time to tell us to do this and do that for you, 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 you. The gospel's saying, give it away, man. Give it away. If you want to have an awesome life, give up yours and go help someone else live. And so sometimes we give up our fancy stuff. Sometimes opening it, reading it, doing it is hard. And being faithful is hard because your family and your friends write you off. They think you're crazy. I'm guilty. I can tell you that right now that not a single person in this room, I've lived in this community for 25 years, and not a single person in this room, none of you are from my other life. Not one. They all think I'm crazy. And they're still waiting for me to get off my Jesus high and fall back into the bar. And God willing, it'll never happen. But they write you off. They think that you're crazy, right? Sometimes pop culture, the people around, just the, the, the population in general, they reject you. They think you're nuts. Sometimes opening it, reading it, and doing it, sometimes it seems to fail. Sometimes you, you venture out and you're afraid to, and you finally are convinced that you should step out in faith and do something for God, and it seems to fail. And you feel like you, you're a loser. But I have really good news for you. The Bible says that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Not the ones who find him necessarily, the ones who seek him. If you step out in faith for Jesus Christ and it fails miserably, it did not in the heavens. He is proud of his son. He is proud of his daughter who steps out in faith for him. And he will bless you because of it. Being faithful is mandatory, mysterious, and merciless. And then Paul closes this paragraph in our text here in, in Acts chapter 20, was quite possibly the most important answer to the most important of human questions. What's the most important human question? Anyone? What's the one question that no matter where you go, no matter who you ask, it always seems to be the big one? What's the big one? Yeah. What's the meaning of life? People have been searching for that answer forever, right? What's the meaning of life? You know that the Bible had, contains a book, it's called Ecclesiastes, that's, that's dedicated completely to that. And this guy Solomon had everything that we diligently work for. He had it a hundred times over. And he tried to find meaning in, in wealth and opulence and palaces and gardens and women and alcohol and food and education and hobbies and everything that we pursue. And at the end of the day, he realized that the, none of those things bring meaning to his life apart from God. And so let's look here what Paul says to this question of why 
do I live? And remember what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? So look at Acts 20, verse 24. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, and then he clarifies, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. That my life is worth nothing unless I do this thing. Nothing. Now, you have to understand this is not a Pauline or a Paul exclusive. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus Christ says to his disciples, I have all authority in heaven and earth. That means I'm the boss and no one can tell you other than what I'm saying. Nothing holds greater weight than what I'm about to tell you. No one can tell you you can't do it or you shouldn't do it. Go make disciples of all nations. And that means go get them saved. And baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then go teach them all that I've taught you. That's what he's told us to do. He didn't just tell Paul to do that. He told us to do that. Every single one of us. And Paul is making a point here. He's saying, God told you guys to do this, and I'm doing it, and I'm doing it faithfully and relentlessly, no matter what happens to me. I don't know what the next city carries with it. I don't know how much pain. I don't know how much reward. I know nothing that's going to happen, but I know this. I'm taking the great commission of Jesus seriously, and come hell or high water, my life, I'm going to pour out for him. My life is worth nothing unless I do this. i got to tell people about Jesus Christ. I have to tell people about Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you? Okay. <clears throat> Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Kim, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Greg, are you a disciple? Angie, are you a disciple of Jesus? How about you, Grayson? You're a disciple. How many people in here are disciples of Jesus Christ? Who has bent the knee to Jesus Christ the Lord and have made him their exclusive Lord and Savior? Proclaim him boldly before men now. Amen, right? You're a disciple of Jesus. So I'm going to just go back, and I'm going to start right here, Miss Allison. You said you're a disciple, and I want you to do me a favor. Based on God's word, I'm putting you on the spot. You came with a preacher, this is what you get. I want you to finish a sentence for me. Did I put it on here? My life is worth nothing unless I what? Can I help you? Tell people about Jesus. Share the gospel. I love that answer. Who else did I pick on? Finish the sentence for me. My life is worth nothing to me unless I... Preach, preach the gospel. Who else? Who else is a disciple of Jesus? My life is worth nothing to me unless... I follow Jesus. That's right. Who else? Who else is a disciple of Jesus? Did you raise your hand? Finish the sentence for me. Br loud and proud. I, my life is worth nothing to me unless I... Share Jesus. Share Jesus. Amen. Who else? Grayson. My life is worth nothing to me unless I... Andy. My life is worth nothing to me unless I... Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, it doesn't matter how much money you have made. It doesn't make any difference how much money you have made. It doesn't matter how successful your company is. It doesn't matter how many family members you have. It doesn't matter how big your house is. It doesn't matter what anything that you have. It doesn't matter how many sports trophies you've acquired over the years. None of this stuff matters. If you don't have this... If you don't spend your life on sharing the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world, then your life is worth nothing. The rest of this stuff means nothing. If you have all the rest of this stuff, but you don't have that, you've got nothing. That's right. And so we are called to be a faithful church of Jesus Christ. He said, this is my church and the gates. I will build my church. And you know how he's going to build it? He has one plan. Do you know what the plan is? You. You. The only way that the gospel reaches the ends of the earth is if you 
open your mouth. But praise God, you've been put into the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is, is one body with many parts. And the Bible says that not everyone's a mouth. You're not a mouth. Maybe you're not a mouth. But I can tell you one thing. There's a guy, who, his name is David. I may have shared it with you. He got baptized here a couple weeks ago. And once a week he walks into this, this church. No matter what I'm doing, he says, Pastor, I need some more business cards. You know why? Because he, everywhere he goes, he tells people about his Jesus and he tells people about his church. I need more business cards. Listen, you may not be that mouth like he is, but guess who gets to pay for the business cards in his hand? You. And so you can be part of, of preaching the gospel to the community. Put business cards in his hand. Encourage him. Pray for him. You might not share the gospel, but bring it to him. Maybe he'll tell him about it. Tell, bring it to me. I'll tell him about Jesus all day long. I don't, you can call me at four in the morning. I'll preach Jesus. I have no, I have no, no worries. You can, you can call me, brother. You can call me. You're up. You might as well. <clears throat> call Pete. He's up, too. You guys sit up all night. <clears throat> He'll preach the gospel. You can preach the gospel to each other. It'd be great. <laughs> Listen, you're part of a body of Christ. And this body, Revolution Church, it has one goal. One goal, expressed in a variety of different ways, but there's one goal, and that is to share the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth, period. Jump on board with that. Amen? Amen? Let's pray, and we'll, we'll have the band come up one more time, and we'll have an opportunity to, to praise Jesus and worship Jesus and tell him how awesome he is. And in this song, maybe it's during this song that you can reestablish that commitment to him. Maybe you can reestablish that commitment to him to, to jump in on the game and to be a part of the church and maybe to pray for a spirit of boldness inside of you so that you can preach the gospel, that you can share the gospel, that you can be actively participating in this church to spread the good news to the community. Listen, I'm going to ask a favor of you. I desperately, 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 it is in my, the, my beating heart to have a youth pastor here to, to, to work diligently to reach the teenagers in this community. As a matter of fact, there's many of kids in our church that are at that point, right, that need a youth pastor in the next year or so. They're going to graduate from Little Children's Church. They need a youth group. They need someone who can shepherd and care for their soul and teach them about Jesus. We need someone. So, so be praying for that person. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that, that God will, will bring that person to this church and will notice who they are when they walk in. And pray how you can participate in, in, in helping that person uh, be, be, be free from the confines of, of the rest of the world so they can pursue that ministry wholeheartedly. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this clear message. I thank you, Lord, for, for, for burning it into my heart. I pray that, that tonight, Lord, that it wouldn't just be uh, words spoken, but Lord, there would be lives changed by the power of your word. Lord, your word is, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. I, I praise you for it, Lord. It is everything to me. Lord, I pray that it would become more and more and more to all of us, Lord, that we would treasure your word. And that we would, we would be good stewards of, of that amazing gift that you've given us, the gospel of Jesus. The greatest gift that we could possibly pass on. Thinking of the words in Proverbs about refreshing others. What if I would take a moment and just venture back in history about 13, 14 years, being in Chili's and saying yes to you. Just thinking about that just refreshes my spirit. I want that for everybody. We know that you want that for everybody. I was reminded again today as I sat with my brother in Christ and was thinking about Jesus and how he came to Jerusalem. He saw the people just like he would do it here as he came to our city and our towns and saw us living our lives frantically running back and forth, chickens with no head, just clueless on how to live life. And you wept. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Lord, our community is filled with those people. Lord, help our hearts burn for them. Help us burn for those people. People that are like us. People that are not like us. 
people that are different color than us, people that are of different socioeconomic status than us, people that live in the worst neighborhoods, people who live in the best neighborhoods, people who work here, people who work there. Help us to love those people unconditionally, just like you do. When I ask with your heads bowed, please, if the good Lord has spoken to you tonight in some way, gently raise your hand up. Thank you. Evidence of the living God. Lord, now we'd like to take this opportunity to praise you. We praise you now, not for what we're to do, but what you have done. We praise you for saving us. We want to take this time to lift up Jesus so that you might draw people to yourself. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your precious name that we pray.